Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to seeing you back in RYC just as soon as uh, conditions permit. We miss each other's camaraderie, but we're happy that we have the Zoom conference calls, which enable us to keep bringing the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon to you no matter what happens with the pandemic, darn it. Uh, our speaker today is also in San Francisco, and he graduated from college just across the bay at UC Berkeley, where he earned a BA in economics. He would go on to Yale Law, and um, after graduating from Yale Law School, go to the U.S. Justice Department during the term of Attorney General Ed Meese. He would go from there to uh, work for of counsel for Quinton Kopp before going out on his own to become a lawyer representing whistleblowers, the very same types of clients that he would have when they would come calling upon him in the Justice Department. He moved to Telegraph Hill in 1995, and after Julius's castle closed in 2007, he began to get curious about this once famous landmark gradually atrophying for disuse. That curiosity turned into commitment when in 2012 he bought it. And so please welcome our guest today, the new, the owner and the would be restorer of Julius's castle, who will recount for us the romantic history of the castle and his ambitions to restore it to its once former glory. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, Paul Scott. Thanks very much, Ron. I uh, really appreciate that. Listen, uh, before we get started, you were uh, sharing some of your stories about how you visited the castle when you were a kid and in later years as well. And we really love those stories. Uh, so if folks would like to share any of those stories or old photos, the photos of the interior are, are invaluable. Uh, we'd love to see them. I, I can give you our email. It's paul at juliuscastlesf.com, P-A-U-L at J-U-L-I-U-S. C-A-S-T-L-E-S-F dot com. And yeah, if people could share that information, it'd be terrific. Um, indeed, it's those kinds of stories that are, are why we're doing what we're doing. When I originally bought the castle, I really wasn't sure what to do with it next. It had been, as you say, atrophying in the neighborhood. And so I was trying to decide what the best thing to do was. And frankly, the best economic move would have been to turn it into a residence the main competitor for the place was indeed planning to turn it into condos. Um, but after hearing those stories, and, and I remember sitting in a banquette and looking out the window and feeling sad at the notion of, of you know, closing the place down and not having it available for people. So I decided, you know, despite having very little restaurant experience, really just having been a busboy when I was 14, that, uh, that we would go ahead and we would try and turn it into a restaurant again. And in, in getting interested in that, uh, I started learning a little more about the history of the building. So uh, I'd love to share some of that with you today. When most people think about Julius Castle, they just think about the castle itself. But interestingly, there was a castle on the hill before Julius Castle arrived. Uh, there was a place called the Telegraph Hill Observatory, and it was built by a man named Frederick Lehman, who uh, built it in a style of a German castle. Uh, and it was really a place of revelry for people in the city. The top floor of the place was an observatory. They would give you field glasses, and you could look out at the view. Um, there was a beer hall down below. Uh, you could watch concerts there. Uh, there were theatrical performances. Um, there was wrestling once a week on Sundays, uh, and they even had jousting matches out on the lawn where people in fully clad armor would, you know, race at each other with swords of flying. So it was really quite the quite the entertainment center. It was really probably the first uh, amusement park of sorts in California. So uh, this view is is from the south, looking over toward Marin. You'll see there's no Golden Gate Bridge in the picture because it didn't exist at the time. Um, here's another shot of the place, uh, again from the south, uh, showing you the actual structure. Uh, it was made of wood, um, and and again has the turrets and the rest of it to make it castle-like in appearance. Uh, Here's a, a, a perspective from the Embarcadero, uh, where you can see the, the main part of the castle up there, top to your right. 
Um, and perhaps interestingly here, you'll see these stairs leading up the filbert steps, but that's what they used to look like. Uh, that's where Humphrey Bogart climbed uh, in the movie Dark Passage, uh, and that came, of course, years later. Um, here's another perspective from uh, the west looking east up Greenwich Street. Um, that at the top here is the end of the castle, the narrower part of the castle. Um, and uh, as you can see there, there's a cable car line. And so when they originally built the castle, um, they didn't have cable car access, but um, they soon realized they needed it to get people to the top of the hill. You can see that it illustrated here uh, as well. There's the cable car and folks coming the, to get on the car. Uh, and so that was a, a big uh, addition. Sutro, uh, I think, helped finance that cable car. And it was in operation for a couple of years. But then, um, as you might imagine, it was a bit of a challenge to make this hill. It was incredibly steep. Um, and at some point um, in the mid-1980s, after a year of festivities on the hill, the cable car had a actually terrible wreck and there was a fatality. Um, and uh, it shut down shortly after that. So access to the castle, I think um, people were just less inclined to take the cable car, as you might imagine. It's a bit nerve-biting, uh, or sorry, nail-biting to climb that hill. Um, in the cable car, uh, if it's safe and if it's led to fatalities, it, it just was not what people were up for doing. So um, business fell off, and uh, in the castle, uh, Layman's Castle, Layman's Folly, as it later became known because it emptied out after that, um, the observatory there, all of it closed down. Uh, and that laid fallow for a number of years until... 1903 when it actually went up in flames and you can see here up at the top of the photo here um, an image of the of the observatory uh, on fire uh, in 1903 mm -hmm. so um, that was uh, a tragic event uh, just uh, obviously sad to see that building go it's uh, you know where the um, Christopher Columbus statue sat which is of course now gone on the top of the Telegraph Hill uh, that's essentially where this castle lay, and uh, and it is, of course, now gone as well. Um, but uh, at the time that it went up in flames, just a year before, um, Julius Ross had arrived in San Francisco, as had um, uh, a man named Louis Master Pasqua, um, who later became the architect for Julius Castle. And the two of them would have seen uh, uh, the observatory on the top of the hill and then also probably almost certainly witnessed it go up in flames. Um, and so would have had some inspiration from that in 1902 and 1903 uh, before um, um, the end of the castle. Julius Ross was, uh, was born in um, 1869. Uh, he came to uh, the United States uh, from northern Italy, from Turin, um, at the age of about 31. And uh, he was... Uh, you know, he was like, I think, most Italian immigrants at the time, really come, coming from an impoverished place. Uh, there were about 4 million Italian immigrants that came in the late 1880s and early 1900s. Uh, about 4 million came to the United States and 10 million in the decade alone that Julius arrived and in the, the decade that uh, Louis arrived as well. Uh, and, uh, and so he really didn't have a lot when he first arrived. Um, but he had his, uh, his uh, cooking skills, and he, so he worked in restaurants, uh, and he had a dream about uh, trying to build a castle uh, someday or build a restaurant someday, um, and, uh, and that uh, ultimately um, was something that he was able to do because he found a lot available on the hill um, that had once been a store the, and, and then later a residence that burnt down in 1918 at the location uh, where the castle stands today. So he bought that lot um, and then he reached out to his, his friend, um, Louis Master Pasqua, um, here's a photo of him, um, to, uh, to help him realize this dream of building a restaurant. And, and whose idea it was exactly of making it into a castle is not entirely clear. Um, if you look at the background of Master Pasqua, uh, he, he, he built a number of unusual buildings in San Francisco. He was a very creative architect. Uh, here is a, a building on 68 McCondry Lane. 
uh, where he's merging uh, different styles of architecture, classical uh, type of architecture with the curved bay, and also arts and crafts type um, of architecture as well. Here's another uh, building that he uh, that he was the architect for at Kearney and Clay. Uh, the decorative detail on that building is very unusual. You don't see it elsewhere, um, and it's evidence again of, of him trying to just come up with something new and different. It seems not being conventional in his style. Here's another building, the Knessa building, um, that he uh, worked on. It uh, preceded uh, the time that he was uh, in San Francisco, but it was damaged in the 1906 earthquake. And um, uh, the record that I've been able to uh, read about this tells us that he added these uh, circular, almost Asian style windows to the building. And so he really, he sort of would defy conventions and do things that suited his fancy. Um, here's another uh, picture of that same building, the Knesset building. Um, and you can see if you're uh, Julius Ross walking down the street and you're trying to decide on an architect, some of these look buildings, a lot of these buildings look pretty conventional. And then you have uh, the Knesset building, which looks very different. And, and actually, just to note there, the Black Cat uh, Saloon is downstairs uh, in that uh, building. It was the first openly gay bar in San Francisco, uh, just a point of interest. Um, in any event, um, so you had an architect that was of you know, great skill and, and, and sort of um, unconventional in his style. And then you also had a man who was not just that, but also an illustrator. Um, Master Pasqua did illustrations um, uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, he sort of moonlighted in, in that fashion for La Italia, uh, the local uh, daily publication in San Francisco. And uh, so here's an example of an illustration that he did for Fior di Italia, which is, I think, the oldest Italian restaurant in San Francisco of um, uh, dating back to, um, I'm going to say it's 1886, I think. Um, but in any event, um, here's uh, another of his illustrations. This is a special menu that he did for them um, where he illustrated all of the different characters who worked at the restaurant. Um, he went by the pen named Llama uh, and was well known for his, uh, his ability as an as a illustrator uh, and doing these kind of caricatures. Here's an advertisement with a great deal of detail, the same kind of caricatures that ran in uh, Leitalia. Uh, so... Uh, that's the man that Julius chose to help him build the castle. And uh, there are no photos of the building um, when it was originally constructed. Um, this is the uh, first one that we have. Um, it's an illustration, obviously. Um, when, when construction began on the building, um, it, it's estimated that it happened in 1923. Um, that's what the permits say. Um, there's a plaque on the front of the building, though, that says 1922. Um, so it's unclear to me whether uh, in true San Francisco fashion, they built it first and asked for permits later. Um, but uh, the, the one thing that we do know is that after this first um, part of the construction occurred with the one turret um, by 1923 and, and you know, customers were being served, the place began to uh, pick up steam pretty much immediately. Um, and so construction ensued and an addition was added. As you can see, a second turret was added to the end of the building. So by 1928, uh, the castle had filled out its full footprint that you, you see today. Um, after, uh, after some years later, that's where we have our first uh, photo of the building. This is how it looks in, in 1939. Uh, it's interesting, there's sort of an arts and crafts style on the front of the building. Um, and then as you turn the corner, as you can see, you have these uh, Gothic style windows, the peaked windows, the narrow um, uh, embrasures and so forth that, uh, you know, and of course the turrets that you would use to defend the castle uh, from the hillside. Um, but uh, this is how it looked in 1939. Um, there's actually 1939 written on a banner there across the entry to the castle. Um, here's another 1939 shot, uh, according to the records that we have associated with the picture. Um, here's one from 1941, um, where really it's much the same kind of condition. You see 
some flowers and, and, and other kind of decorative and festive elements added to the building to make it a festive place uh, and a place where people were welcomed um, uh, by the proprietor. Uh, from the very get-go, uh, the restaurant uh, was successful uh, as much as anything, um, not because only because of its views, but also because of the food. Um, the, the menu was, uh, was tasty and had a lot of Italian and sometimes some French influences in it. Um, you can see over here that this meal uh, for a buck twenty-five, you get a, a complete meal, and if you wanted to have uh, a riesling along with it, you could get that for sixty cents. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. The, Are you yeah. going to be able to restore the pricing as well as the building? Yeah, I, we're we're working on that. We're going to try and find a way. Um, I, <laughs> um, Great. Here's the here's the flip. We won't hold you menu. to that, but we hear that we hear that's aspirational. Pricing. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's the flip side of that menu. It was delivered in sort of a postcard format. So, you know, if you visited the place, you could send someone a copy of your menu. Um, and there's Julius. Again, you saw a picture of him earlier. Here he is with his two dogs, his two colleagues that he, he had with him at all times. Um, and, uh, and it really, it was just a convivial place uh, to spend time. Um, so, uh, after uh, you know having this kind of success locally, um, business took off to such, such an extent that when when he originally opened the restaurant, it was a dirt road leading up to the place. Uh, but they had to at some point in the 30s build a turnaround uh, so that cars could be turned around and sent back up the hill quickly enough to to deal with the increased traffic from cars and so forth. Uh, later, that became unnecessary as cars had better turning radiuses. But uh, you know they did briefly have uh, turnaround there. And then um, also uh, what came with great food, a terrific view, and sort of an exceptional environment like that was a, was a ton of celebrities. Um, I think in the uh, blurb that we circulated with this talk, uh, you know, you've already heard about Robert Redford, Sean Connery, Marlon Brando, um, you know, folks like that, Sir Edmund Hillary, Star Wars cast, and that sort of thing. They all visited the place uh, to enjoy a view and, and a meal there. But maybe perhaps more interestingly, um, back in Julius's day, um, there were stars of his time that also uh, visited that, uh, you know, really livened the place up. For example, um, uh, Jackie Coogan, the kid in this picture, and from the movie The Kid with Charlie Chaplin, uh, he, he frequented the restaurant. Um, another uh, Famous star at the time, Douglas Fairbanks, known as the King of Hollywood. Um, not sure if folks know, but I think he was the first person to host the Oscars. He was one of the founding members of United Artists. He hung out there. Um, Lon Chaney, um, who uh, you know, starred in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the original film version of the of the production. Um, he also uh, spent time there. Just as some examples, you had some real star power, of course. Gary Grant. Uh, I think it's well known that he uh, would uh, visit the castle. Um, similarly, Ginger Rogers. Uh, so it just has this really colorful history of interesting people who came through, uh, visited the place, were charmed by it, and, and really had terrific experiences there. Um, uh, Dashiell Hammett, uh, he even uh, set a scene there in one of his novels uh, where Sam Spade visited the castle with his secretary. Um, and uh, and so it really it had quite the quite the history of stars and celebrities in the time that Julius Ross was alive, um, who who would visit the place. Um, you know, he he actually also became a bit of a star himself or a, a celebrity about town. Um, you'll you can read stories about mm. Julius driving about town in his 1930 oh. Chrysler Imperial, um, and uh, you know this is. Uh, uh, you know, kind of a faded old version of his car. Um, it matches up pretty well with uh, one of the cars that I've seen and that I showed you in an earlier uh, photo of the castle. Um, perhaps a better likeness in terms of color would be something like this. It's a 1930 Chrysler Imperial, but the color is probably more like what it would have been back in Julius's day. Uh, you can see the rumble seat in the back. Julius liked to have his two dogs sit in the back, and he actually built a little windshield visor for them so they could travel about town with him and not, uh, you know, and be comfortable back there. 
so it was, you know, he was a spectacle in his life, not only at the castle, but also just in the way he carried himself about town. He was a, a special individual. Um, he, he really did live quite the life. Um, he died in 1947. And, uh, and, and when you think back about the man's life, uh, in addition to the castle, just all the things that he would have witnessed uh, from the castle, he would have seen, you know, the Bay Bridge being built. You could have sat there and had a meal and seen the bridge get built. Uh, you would have seen um, Treasure Island get dredged up uh, for the, the fair that they held at, uh, at on Treasure Island. Uh, you would have seen the naval ships coming and going during World War II for, to supply the war effort. So all of that would have happened uh, during Julius's watch, and um, and it was it was definitely a sad time when he passed away. Um, but uh, when he did pass away, uh, the magic of the castle, of course, still stayed, and, uh, and it was the inspiration for a couple of movies. Um, the movie The House on Telegraph Hill uh, was uh, situated at Julius Castle. Um, they took great liberties with the facade of the building when they uh, filmed the movie there, though, if you look and you see um, them beginning their efforts here, you can see the beginning of a construction of an entrance for uh, the, the, the building that would ultimately be you know, constructed there at the castle. This is how it actually looked when they were done. So it was completely different um, at the end in the movie uh, in terms of how the building looked than it did in real life. Um, but I would note that they, they built this, and we can maybe go back a slide, uh, to this, they, they added a turret to the neighboring building, perhaps as an homage to uh, uh, Julius and Master Pasqua's uh, fantasy castle that lay behind the house on Telegraph Hill. Um, but this is what it looked like in the movie. About the only thing that's uh, a dead likeness is this rail and that light, which remains there today. Um, but uh, in, a, in the interior, it unfortunately, doesn't look exactly like that. That's uh, courtesy of Universal Studios. But the movie was set there, and all the locations are the same. The cars come and go from there, so it's a, it's a it's a still a point of interest. Um, another movie that, uh, that did some filming there was uh, *Raging Tide*. That was also 1951. Uh, here's a shot of Shelley Winters coming out of the uh, building uh, after a, a moment inside the building. So, uh, you know, the castle still had some charm, and you know, the the glow from Julius's reign. Uh, was lasting on uh, into this uh, early 50s period. But I have to say, when, when you just look at the, the condition of the castle, it began to fade a little bit um, in, in the 50s. Uh, you can see here that um, you know, some of the decorative elements have been removed, um, and it just looks a little bit plainer um, and, and not quite as festive as it once did in its earlier years. Um, this, this is a, a survey that was done in, in 1976, an architectural richness survey, and uh, it commented something to the effect that uh, the, um, the richness and the excellence, it, it graded it at a zero. So I think that some of the, you know, some of the efforts that have been made to make the place charming had, had, had been diminished, and, uh, and or, you know, there maybe wasn't a full appreciation of, of the design elements that were, you know, thought of by Master Class Pasco for the building. There was also a written comment that said, lousy food, great bar. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's an architectural observation, but that, you know, was kind of the take, I, I assume, on the place in the 70s. Um, fortunately, um, in the 80s, it took a turn for the better. Um, the Pollock family uh, bought the castle, and it began to uh, be livened up again. Um, here's a shot in the early 1980s. Um, and then um, by 1991, uh, Jeffrey Pollock had done a full restoration job on the, on the building, and it really did look pretty magnificent again, particularly in this shot. Um, and, uh, you know, he went with the color pink to give it, you know, kind of another fantasy element to it. Um, the, uh, the building, you know, continued on uh, with, uh, you know, some success until 2000. Here's a shot here. Um, and then in 2006, uh, Jeffrey Pollock sold the building to a new owner, and they began some renovations. This is those renovations that are ensuing in 2006. Um, when the renovations were done, uh, this is how the building looked. Um, and unfortunately, the, the owner who had it in, in this time frame 
just didn't have a lot of luck with the building. Um, they landed up uh, expanding the envelope. If you look over here, actually, you can see how the, the building was built out over this uh, what was a, a roof line, which is an important arts and crafts element to the, the design that Pasco came up with, and they pushed out this uh, space behind it to, to hide that roof line. Um, and uh, so that was a problem with the city. Uh, when the, um, the owner at the time uh, landed up having, uh, and I guess apparently the neighbor reported him, um, and uh, and the answer to that was to buy the neighbor's building um, to hopefully, I think, um, you know, get some peace. But of course, once the city was rolling, um, there was really nothing that could be done. So there were issues with the city in terms of, you know, this, these changes to the envelope. There was a lawsuit with the operator uh, and the place just, it went in, it closed in 2007 and, uh, and, and lay fallow for a, a period of time. Um, that's what it looked like in 2012. Uh, when the owner was in bankruptcy. And again, you can see this wall that's been pushed out here um, uh, was in bankruptcy. And uh, and that's when I decided to, um, you know, take a gamble and, uh, and, 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 and purchase this building. Um, so uh, when I first bought it, um, I thought, well, how bad can it be? Um, it's, uh, you know, I had done some um, development work of modest, of, uh, you know, proportions, and I thought we could, you know, push this thing forward. And I actually planned on having it open for the America's Cup in 2013. Um, <laughs> and, uh, of course, that didn't happen. Um, there have been a, a number of hurdles that we've had to deal with in trying to get the uh, restaurant open again, um, the first of which was these uh, changes to the envelope required us to, um, you know, to get – authorization from the city to alter it back in a way that would work for them and also as a practical matter to operate the restaurant. That took a couple of years. Um, in the course of um, submitting plans to the city, we recognized that the building was over the property line on both the south, um, east, um, and northern uh, boundaries. Uh, so, of course, we told the city where these issues were. And that led to a great deal of consternation because on the north side, we were bordering Pioneer Park, and you can't lease or buy parkland from the city um, unless you amend the charter of the city. And so that led to two years of the city's greatest legal minds puzzling over what we were going to do, and ultimately, I think, throwing their hands up in the air and writing us a letter that said, well, we realize you're on our land, but go about your business. Um, so we have proceeded from there, even though we're still um, um, uh, north of the property line on the, yeah, on the northern boundary. Uh, on the other two sides, those are essentially streets on the south side and the east side, so that's not a big deal, apparently, to solve with DPW, and we've solved that issue. I should mention, just as a matter of completeness, that on the western side, we're not over the property line, but the other folks are on our property. So we're pretty complete in having issues on all sides of the building. Um, the <laughs> we, 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 so you don't we, want to leave one of the sides without a no, potential. Yeah, I don't even want to know what's going on underneath the building. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so that's that's basically the condition of the building as, as we took it on. Um in addition to those hurdles with the property lines and the, the alterations that we had, you know, once we got that stuff, the, the, the envelope sorted out, we applied for a conditional use permit. I, I, I initially was not of the mind that we even needed a conditional use permit because it had historically been a restaurant, and uh, San Francisco has grandfathered conditional use permits for places that have been there a long time. They don't actually – somebody didn't apply for a conditional use permit back in um, – you know, 1922, they just started a restaurant. And then later in time, when those became a requirement, the city um, recognized that those restaurants in place essentially were grandfathered in. Um, but, and, and we figured that was true with us, but the city said, well, you know, you've been, you haven't been operating for, uh, for more than three years, so it's an abandoned use. Um, and of course, we didn't believe that it was abandoned, but um, um, Supervisor Peskin at the time said, hey, look, the, the neighborhood has some concerns about how it's operated. And um, so we thought, why not just go through the exercise again of getting another conditional use permit? So we sat down with him and we sat down with Jeffrey Pollock and we came up with some conditions to make everybody happy. And those got enshrined 
into the conditional use permit that we ultimately got. You would have thought that would have been good enough, but then, you know, because the Planning Commission granted us the, the permit, you know, unanimously, uh, but some folks still objected and appealed that to the Board of Supervisors. So that took a good chunk of time, and then we had a hearing for the Board of Supervisors and, uh, and you know, won that unanimously as well. So I thought, great, we're done now. We can, you know, move forward with this. Um, but, of course, uh, after that, uh, there's always the courts. And so someone, a few people filed a lawsuit, and that took an extended period of time um, to deal with as well. And ultimately, we won that in convincing fashion also. So we're done with the lawsuits and most of the bureaucracy um, and the you know, alterations to the envelope. And now we're turning inward uh, the building. We've been working on the woodwork. Um, he here's how the exterior now looks today. That's a very sort of monochrome palette um, by design because it's going to have decorative, decorative elements against it. So this doesn't really give you a fair representation, um, but uh, here's a, a shot uh, from the east that maybe gives you something of a better idea. You see these gold glints, there will be more of that and some other elements that we add to the front of the building as well. But the envelope is looking pretty good now. Um, and as I say, we're working on the woodwork and we're working on you know, trying to move ahead with what we need to do to reopen the restaurant uh, once again. Um, of course, COVID has now <laughs> added another uh, dimension to the discussion as well, um, but uh, we're, you know, trying to proceed as best we can um, and uh, and get to a place where, God willing, when we're all uh, able to gather together, um, you know, your members and, you know, my friends and people in the neighborhood and people from outside San Francisco will be able to come back to the castle and really have some good times there once again. So. That's the plan. So thanks, Ron, for letting me share that. Wonderful. Um, Paul, holy cow, uh, ambitious and also very, very fun. Uh, San Francisco is famous for entrepreneurs. And so you're, you know, falling in line with all kinds of traditional San Francisco um, activity. Uh, how many seats did it have in those days? And how many seats will you expect to have in Julius's Castle when you open for lunch food again? Well, the top floor of the restaurant actually used to be a residence. Julius lived there with his wife and his daughter and his two dogs. Um, and downstairs was a garage. Uh, and over the years, those spaces have been expanded just because of the popularity of the place. So presently, there are 115. Um, I think the capacity of the place is about 150. And, you know, so with staff and the rest of it, you'll end up in the 100 teens as, you know, the number of patrons you can have at the place. Okay. And um, how would you characterize the a cuisine back in Julius's heyday? And then, so give me some description of it. Uh, how would you characterize it? And what do you, what's the cuisine going to be when you open? That's a great question. Um, the cuisine was really, you know, continental, I would say. Um, there was both Italian and, and French influences on the menu. Um, and, and that's where we're probably going to head with this as well. Um, you know, we, we've looked at the menu over the years, and it's stayed more or less consistent with that. Of course, you know, we are going to want to have, um, you know, seasonal products, uh, you know, and so there's going to be a California influence as well in terms of what's available. Uh, we're trying to be environmentally sensitive, and so that's going to, you know, affect the equation also. But really, in terms of the theme, we're really not going to stray too far from, you know, the history of the place. Um, so I would expect it to be continental with maybe some odd, uh, you know, California style dishes thrown in as well. Now, one of the, one of the things I remember as a boy, when my folks would take us there, um, and it was kind of an occasion restaurant, we would go there Sunday night and we'd go there for big events. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you were a high school kid, you, that was one of the places you could go for senior ball and things like that. It was like a cool occasion restaurant. Um, are you expecting it to be like that again? Is it always going to be that from your view? I sure hope Special so. Special occasion? I mean, well, it, it, there's, there's no avoiding the fact that it's going to be a destination for folks and a, a place for a special occasion. And honestly, that's, that's a large motivator for, for me doing this, um, is to have it be a place where people from the city and from California and outside, you know, even the U.S., 
come to visit because those are the stories I've heard and it's great to hear people tell me you know about their fond memories uh, actually in the bankruptcy court I remember the judge himself saying I remember I had my first job interview at Julia's Castle so it's just like everywhere I turn there's somebody with a story about the place and I, and I want that to continue um, that's a that's a big you know motivation for me in doing this um, but uh, that said I also am hoping to make it a bit of a local um, for the people in the neighborhood I'd like it to be accessible you know, for there to be some things on the menu that make it an attractive, you know, place for them to stop and have a bite, grab a beer or wine, you know, and just kind of socialize with other people in the neighborhood. So we're going to try and find that sort of a balance between it being a local and also just a great place uh, for people to go from, you know, near and far. In the early 70s, I was recruited to be the youngest of six owners of a restaurant called Shanty Gap on Polk at Washington. And I was told after that experience, um, a man is not a man until he's lost his butt in either a magazine or a restaurant. And at that point, I'd had an ownership in a, a magazine called Kids Magazine on the East Coast. And he, my buddy said to me, Bill Honig said, Ron, you've had two chances. You blew them both. So now is it your aspiration that you'll become a man somewhere in this process or that you can defy the odds and make a success out of a restaurant? I, well, you know, I I really, I, at this point, it's complete roll of the dice. I'm pretty much doing it because it feels like destiny. Um, as I said, I really had no, you know, particular dream of being a restaurateur. This, this building has sort of captured me. And so I'm, you know, trying to realize that dream of the building and for the folks who were interested in coming to it. And we, you know, we'll be bringing in people who have that same dream. Um, but uh, I would say what I'm really trying to avoid is that, what do they say about boats, where the second uh, happiest day in a man's life is the day he buys a restaurant. I'm hoping that I, I do not live that cliche. Um, so I'm hoping it's actually the, the happiest day when I open and it stays that way. So part of the tradition or the early heritage was they had wrestling nights and they made kind of amusement out of this. Um, is this a no holds barred kind of a play, or have you already drawn the line and said you're not going to have wrestling? No, <laughs> wrestling was at the Telegraph Hill Observatory. That place went under in two years, so I'm not, there's no wrestling. I mean, certainly not no. a public uh, display. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so now, in the original pictures that you showed in the early history, that Telegraph Hill Observatory was farther up on the top of the hill because that looked like it was on yeah, the top yeah. of the hill. It was, it was okay. like, like like I said, it's Pioneer Park uh, where um, Coit Tower's parking lot is, the north lot. That's where um, the observatory is located. And so what's the elevation currently of Julius's castle? How high up do you by chance happen to know the elevation? Are you 150 yeah. feet above water? What do you know? I, I, I wish I could answer that for you. I can't. Um, it's a couple hundred steps, I would say. And, uh, and I would just add, that's one of the things we're going to try and do um, is, is encourage people to actually walk the steps um, with the advent of, uh, you know, these scooters and electric bikes and so forth that, you know, can power people to transport themselves individually. We'll be trying to encourage people to do that again. Um, we're trying to be sensitive to the neighborhood. So we're thinking about those things in terms of, you know, access and, um, and the elevation, you know, does make it tough to get to. Um, but it's also what gets you your views, so that makes it worth it. So did Julius, did Julius have any children? He did. He had one daughter. Yeah. And there was no, did they continue after he passed away? In, yeah, I'm not um, aware of any living descendants of Julius Ross. Um, if they are out there and they see this video, I would love to hear from them um, and, uh, you know, have them share some of their history. Um, and I know there's been a lot of good times at that castle. And in ensuing years with all the owners um, have, you know, had some, you know, exceptional experiences with the place. So now what are the next hurdles in terms of opening it? And when do you expect you might be able to open? Uh, well, are they zoning the, hurdles or just construction and time? Well, we're, 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 we have to do some ADA access work now. Uh, that was another thing that's literally taken, you know, we've been at it for over a year on coming up with a plan that's going to um, allow some ADA access. Um, as it has operated over the decades, it's never really had ADA access. 
So we're going to create that on the ground level of the castle. Um, so we have to do some work with the sidewalk, which means taking it out into the street. And you know, one of the suggestions that was put to us was that we needed to raise the entire street in front of the castle to solve the problem. Um, so it's that kind of discussion. Those are the kind of conversations that we have pretty routinely. I think we found a better solution, honestly, for that. But we do need to create that access, um, and uh, and we, we we need to continue and to finish the build out. Uh, unfortunately, working with planning right now is pretty difficult. Um, you know, we've had you know just recently we've had a mechanical permit sitting there for months, um, and they just you know they're they're in a tough spot with uh, the the situation with COVID, and so things aren't moving as quickly as we'd like. We ha we do have a terrific person in the uh, preservation uh, uh, division at planning who is helping us now, and uh, so he's great to work with. And, uh, you know, I think folks want to see it happen. Um, you know, there, there have been some hurdles over the years, but I think people are of a like mind that this is a, a terrific San Francisco institution. Um, you know, it preserves the history of the town. It's something special. Um, I think everybody would love to see it you know, come together. So did I miss what, what it, if you were to throw a dart at the wall across the room <laughs> at an opening date, yeah. where would that dart land? What date yeah, are you imagining? Yeah. That was uh, I, I that was a, an astute uh, observation. I I did dodge that question. <laughs> well, let me put it this way: I've been saying since uh, 2012 that it'll be open next year. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm still at work. I honestly I say you know I, every time I think that we should be you know on a good path, something else rears its head. I really don't think that's likely that it's going to get delayed out that much further. Um, but obviously, right now, nobody's opening restaurants. There are predictions of 50% of the restaurants in the town going under, like solid, realistic predictions. Um, so, you know, we really have to be thoughtful about, you know, when we would open again. Um, it, it, you can't really make a living with a restaurant just doing takeout and the rest of it. So we do have those limitations, but we're going to try and move the ball ahead. And so when, you know, the day comes when, you know, we've got uh, – you know, uh, some relief, a vaccine, what have you, from the problem, and people are able to get out again uh, that will be, you know, near or close or ready uh, to go. So, like, I guess if I was to be held to it, because I just dodged your question again, I would say probably within a year. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. That's I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic about COVID when I say that, I suppose. That's I'm hoping that there's a vaccine. So, having bought the building eight years ago, that is ambitious. Um, give us a funny story about something that's happened since you bought the building. Uh, you know, you've done a great job of um, chasing uh, an elusive, you know, uh, windmill of a, of a project, but there's got to be a funny story here. Give me a funny story. All right. Well, I'm not sure if this is uh, funny or not, but I'll tell it to you on the condition that everybody on this video call keep this a secret. Um, so, <laughs> That's a good start for a funny story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, when we were renovating the roof of the place, um, there were um, some roofers up there um, doing what's called torch on. Uh, and I, uh, you know, went up to check on their work and looked at everything and they cleaned up and everything looked like everything was all set. And so uh, I took the, the crew off and we were, going to, you know, move some materials at a nearby site just down the filbert steps, only a couple blocks away. Um, so we went down there, started moving the other materials, and uh, after, I'm going to say, it seems like 20 minutes, half an hour max, I think, you know, under half an hour, I got a call and someone said to me, Paul, your building's on fire. And I was like, you got to be crazy. I was just there. That's not possible. And they said, there are fire trucks, there's smoke, there's a fire. So I, of course, raced up the steps and, you know, started heading down Filbert uh, toward the hill. Excuse me, started heading down Montgomery uh, toward the castle. Um, and uh, it was like Armageddon. There were dozens of firemen. There were, you know, ladder trucks, you know, regular fire trucks. There were, you know, two chiefs. I didn't know that the fire department had multiple chiefs. There were a couple of chiefs there. Um, and they were already in the building. The door had been, you know, axed open, and um, and they had gone in, and apparently an ember had laid, uh, you know, remained, uh, uh, you know, lit on the on the roof, even though we had all been there and just looking at it. 
um, and and the and the building, the, the turret on the north end of the building, literally was up in flames. Um, and uh, so they came through, they they put it out, um, and uh, and it was you know very traumatic, you know, because if the building had gone, it was a dry time of the season, it would have been bad for all sorts of reasons, you know, including other buildings on the hill. Um, so. You know, it was it was a relief to 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 have them there, and you know, said thanks to the guys. Uh, and you know, one of the things I said was, you know, when this is all said and done, we are definitely having a party for the the firemen, the fire you know, people who you know helped put this fire out. Um, and I and I learned that the guy who um, saw the fire and called it in was a guy named uh, Julio. He had been on his break down on Bay, um, getting a bite to eat, and he looked up, he saw smoke coming off the castle. And so he called it in, and um, some folks from another station hustled up there, kicked down the door, put out the fire, you know, just in time, essentially. As I said, it was a very short time frame. Um, so when we have this party, my intention is to um, change the name of the castle for a day, and it will be called Julio's Castle. <laughs> for one day. How oh, fun. So – now, um, one of the uh, one of our esteemed members and an incredibly uh, brilliantly talented friend of mine is a guy named Larry Mendel, and he is a very very successful restaurateur, very brilliant person, and he's had MacArthur Park and Chow and Prego, and um, El Fornio, and um, has a beautiful restaurant in Sausalito these days as well downtown Sausalito, um, Pojo. And um, so the model that many people like him would have is they'd get a great chef and they'd get a good solid financial source and then they get an architect and they'd put those collaborators together to come up with a very powerful restaurant. Now, you have a location, you have a famous name. Is it your plan to go hunt for a restaurateur and or a great chef? What are the other strong components that you think you might want to add to the sort of uh, mix of your business? Um, well, it's, that's a great question because we really puzzled over that because, you know, as I said, I don't have a lot of experience in the restaurant business. Um, I've learned more about it since I've had the castle and had a number of conversations with folks. Um, and uh, it was, you know, initially a thought to just lease it, but I, I really can't do that because I live in the neighborhood and I am constantly being asked for, you know, it, it, the, the operation of the place is integral to the neighborhood as well. And I want peace for the neighbors. And I want it to be something that they appreciate and, and enjoy having in the neighborhood. And so I really need to be involved, uh, uh, you know, more than I, than simply just leasing out the building. Uh, the last uh, owner tried leasing it out and that structure didn't work. Um, I thought also of perhaps just hiring an operator, a, you know, a company that would manage it essentially, and then, um, you know, they would take care of hiring all the staff and, and I would really sort of still be, you know, kind of just in an absentee role. Um, but we, we looked at that and honestly, I spoke to some really terrific people, like some very high level, high quality restaurateurs in the city. And we went through, honestly, like, you know, 50 page agreement draft type stuff where, you know, we were looking at all the details and just in, in trying to, to see if that could work, it just didn't ultimately pencil as well, because at the end of the day, I want to be able to hire a very high quality chef, very high quality management, and really, you know, be able to direct the kind of money to them that has them stay and, you know, allows us to keep good people. You know, that's a tough thing in the restaurant business here with the, the margins being what they are, that you just can't keep people. So, you know, having, you know, the budget to be able to do that and, and, and sort of run it, you know, in, in a way that allows us to have some continuity is what I'm after. So uh, I've got a, a, a fellow, um, Patrick Hall, who's kind of acting as a, a as a mentor and kind of a Jerry West type uh, person for me right now. Um, and then also, you know, obviously I've been talking to other folks as well. So what I want to do is bring in a terrific top-notch chef, uh, you know, really high level uh, uh, a GM, and then, you know, let them, you know, run the place in large measure. But obviously, as I said, with supervision and quarterbacking, by you know a consultant like Pat um, or you know you know other folks who are you know giving me tips, I'm always taking them um, and I always uh, welcome uh, advice on it. So uh, that's the plan, and um, you know I'm hoping that 
you know, people will be excited about the place returning to operation and we're going to try and do a good job um, and just make it successful again. So uh, what meals you're going to, it's going to be a dinner restaurant, a, a, a likely a luncheon restaurant. Do you have any notions about that? What, what yeah. meals do you plan to serve? Lunch and dinner? Would you imagine a breakfast? What's your picture now? My, my, my guess is it, it historically has been a place for dinner um, seven nights a week and we'll likely, you know, continue that. I think that it's also possible to do a brunch there on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, and because that, I think we just, you know, there's the, all the open deck space on the, uh, on the back of the building and elsewhere. Um, it's also something that would be nice for folks in the neighborhood, I think, to be able to wander down the street and have brunch there on a weekend. Um, so that's the thought. Um, to, to, con- to, to, I don't think we would do lunch, but I think that we'll probably do uh, dinners and brunches. So now for the, for those who do, haven't been to the, to the restaurant, it was an incredibly big deal, fun place to go when I was a little boy. Um, tell people when you look west, how far can you see from west to east? What's the westernmost edge of your view? And what is the easternmost, southernmost edge of your view? Well, how you, far can west can you, see? you can see Alcatraz as you look to the west. Um, you can't quite see the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, as you look to the in a sort of southeast, uh, you can, of course, right. see the Bay Bridge. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a very panor- panoramic view. I mean, it's a, it's a spectacular view. There's a reason that, you know, folks are interested in turning it into a residence um, because of those views. Um, so, mm-hmm. uh, but this way, you know, everybody will enjoy them. How many square feet is it? About 4,500. Mm-hmm. And what size is the lot? Crazy question, but we might as well know. Uh, about 3,500 for the lot. It's actually on two lots. It's on um, lots, yeah. Uh, it's got two addresses, um, 302 Greenwich and 1531 Montgomery Street, although inexplicably for many years it bore the address 1541 Montgomery Street on the front of it. Um, so it's gone through, you know, it has multiple addresses. When I try and, you know, call the city to see if they have some record, I'm reeling off addresses. And actually, it has even other addresses. I, I've seen 304 Greenwich um, placed on it as well. But, uh, so, yeah. So give people dire- – I know, I know you aren't open yet, but you're going to open. So give people driving directions to get to Julius's Castle when Paul Scott has opened it. Uh, they want to come to North Beach, uh, to Washington Square, to Union Street. You go up Union and hang a left on Montgomery. Um, but I'm guessing um, most po- folks probably won't be driving. Most folks will probably be, you know, again, when we have a vaccine and times are safer, probably be in an Uber or a Lyft. Or, in, as I say, we're going to try and encourage people to make it there on a scooter or a bike or on foot. Um, there's a terrific walk to be had coming up the steps. It's really beautiful. Um, so we're going to encourage people to, you know, to explore the hill and, and uh maybe save one car trip down the road there. Well, Paul Scott, it's been uh, really a, a, a charmed luncheon. Thank you so much for uh, telling us about your uh, beautiful restoration project of Julius's Castle. Those of us who, like me, went there as young boys way, way back in the 40s as a young kid, uh, and often all the way through, you know, 60s and 70s, uh, it's a very ambitious but actually a very cool component of San Francisco's heritage that you are intending to restore. Congratulations for your ambition and all the very best of luck. The St. Francis Yacht Club, which was founded in 1927, had a new building at the same time as this was opened in 1928 and 29. And so uh, our Yacht Club shares some bit of the historic heritage of Julius's castle. And those of us who are longtime members uh, all remember it. I'm sure we all uh, smile in your direction and wish you the very best of luck with your plans. So thanks very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Um, and with that, our luncheon is adjourned. Thanks a Thank lot, Ron. It was a lot of fun. Take care. You're, our, our pleasure, mate. 